Hello and welcome to 3ABN Live. We are so thrilled to have this opportunity to just spend some time with you and we thank you for joining us tonight. I hope that you've had a really good day. We've had a good day here at 3ABN. We hope yours has been even better. Tonight we are going to be talking about an exciting topic. You know, next year, the year of 2014, has been announced by our president, Ted Wilson, the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, as the International Year of Evangelism. Mm. And when Jesus gave the Great Commission to go ye into all the world and make disciples out of all nations, he was talking to you and me. And it's not just the people who are on television, and it's not the work that I do on television. It's that it's when we go out and really make friends with our next door neighbors, with the, with the people we work with, with people we meet at the grocery store. It's an important thing that we share the gospel. And it's not just important for us, it will help us grow, but it is important because we are the ones who can show the love of Christ. We are a letter written on the heart from the Lord and that's what will attract people to Jesus. And tonight we are so excited because we've got something that you are familiar with and yet we're taking it to the next level. So I want to introduce you to our special guest tonight. First, we have Charles Bird, who is the president of Questline Productions. Charles, you're not a stranger to 3ABN. A lot of people are going to immediately recognize your face because you have a very popular program called Thunder in the Holy Land. And so you've been here how many times now? Well, I, I can't even count how many times you've privileged me to be with you here at 3ABN. Well, we're just glad you're here tonight and excited that you've got something to introduce to us. Then we have Steve Haley with us and you are the president of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. You're not a stranger either. You've been here. I know you're not because I've got a free <laughs> offer right here that tells me that this is something that we talked about actually in the past, right. haven't we? That's right. Steve, we're very glad to have you. Great to be here. And then we have Dr. Melvin Santos with us. And Melvin, you are a pastor. That's right. You've got your doctoral degree. You're also the ministerial field liaison for discipleship and the Asian Pacific pastors. What is a ministerial liaison for discipleship? Shelley, that me I represent basically in North America the the pastors and give them the opportunity to be able to train them specifically number one on discipleship and to provide for them training and resources so they can uh, have an effective soul winning church or to create a disciple making platform in their churches. Wow. This is going to we're going to come back and visit that in just a minute because that sounds like a very exciting position. Yes, and I know that the gentlemen here have told me that to get to know Dr. Santos is to love him. He is a very congenial person and loves the Lord with all of his heart. Before we get started, though, with our big announcement, what we want to do is have a song. And tonight we are going to have T. Marshall Kelly, who is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. If you pray with T. Marshall, you know that he has really got a heart for the Lord. And he is going to sing, He Was Found Worthy. Thank you, T. Marshall Kelly, one of my favorite singers and favorite people in the whole wide world. We are coming to you live, and so we have... We invite you to call in if you have any questions about what we're talking about tonight. You can call us or at 618-627-4651 or you can send your questions to uh, 3ABN, excuse me, you can send your questions to live at 3ABN.org or if you are interested in our free offer, which is a DVD of the interview that we did before on this Thunder Project, you can email us at freeoffer at 3abn.org. Now we've got that over with, let's get into this. <laughs> okay, Charles, we want to kind of update people. Most, I think Thunder in the Holy Land has been such a popular program, and I believe the Lord really inspired you when He had you use young people uh, besides you who are kind of doing the rap on the program, I think he inspired you because 
this is a program that is appealing to all ages. But for someone who may be tuning in tonight who's not familiar with Thunder, tell us a little bit about this project and why you, who are a pastor, who called me two and a half years ago to say, I've got this idea, it's burning in my soul. And he said, I just know God's called me to do this. He gave up the security of his job as a pastor. His wife, Karen, gave up her job. Uh, I know that this has set you back. Uh, two and a half years of just a passion that you've been pouring into the project. Tell us a little more about Thunder in the Holy Land. Well, Thunder in the Holy Land was uh, a dream that that uh, came to fruition really when I met uh, Pastor Chuck Coley, who's also been here before. And uh, that's exciting to me because I remember the day that we were sitting in a ministerium group and, and he said to me, I've created a new Bible study series. And I, I was yawning at this point, this is shop talk, this is pastor, I mean, he does it, I do it, this is what we do. Until he said, 80 to 90 percent of those who start my Bible studies finish. And 70 to 80 percent make a decision for Christ and are still in the church a year later. Mm. Wow. And I thought to myself, what? You know, I, you hear these stories perhaps from Africa or South America, but in Wisconsin, you know, uh, Midwestern, white Anglo-Saxons, could that be true? <laughs> and uh, I was so impressed with, with his testimony that short little sentence just hung on me. And when I went home, I called him up and I said, I gotta see what you've got. So I went, drove uh, up there, which was a long drive, spent the night with him. And the next day he had lined up his Bible says and we went from study to study together. And I will never do Bible studies the same. Just that one day, uh, his method really is more caught than taught. It's a simple, elegant method you don't have to know a lot. You don't have to memorize a lot. And here's some of the secrets. Pastor Chuck told me, he said, you know, I used to take people with me to get Bible studies, to train them. And they'd get in the car with me afterwards and they'd say, Pastor, that was just so wonderful. But I could never do that. I could never do that, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and when you think, well, you know, you're paid to do it. So you get to stay home and read the Bible until you've got it down. And then, but me, by the time I get up in the morning and, and get the kids off to school and, and go to work and then come home and take them to Suzuki lesson or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I don't have time to prepare an eloquent Bible study. I mean, I love the Lord. I read my Bible every day. I'd love to talk you know, to people about Jesus more, but I'm not sure exactly how to go about that. I just don't feel capable. And so he said, I'm going to produce my own Bible study to where I can just stick in the VHS, and it was a VHS tape, or stick in the VHS tape. So when the people come with me, they'll think, oh, I could do that. And so he sticks in this tape, which is just a glorified PowerPoint presentation, well written. Uh, Pastor Chuck Coley is a deep, godly, spiritual man. I hold him in very high regard, very thoughtful and thought through. And uh, so his presentation, though it's extremely simple, was winning people to Jesus. And as I watched the video, this just PowerPoint slides, it just about killed me because I, <laughs> I grew up, you know, in the, in the video age, and I thought, it isn't this video that's getting people. Something else is going on here, because you can't watch this, just a slideshow, and, and have those kind of results. So I, I watched closer, and, and the miracle was his second half hour. It, it, he watched the video for a half hour, excellent presentation, but then he had, you know, I'd like to play. Can we play? Sure. Let's play together. I, I, I brought it right here. We're live. I don't mind playing. Sure, let's play. There you go. That's what I love about having you on. I never know what we're going to do, and that's fun. Yes. Okay. Well, here's the thing. He hands everyone in the Bible study a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, first off, it has every verse that's in his Bible study. Mm -hmm. so, so everyone has every verse that's going to be on the screen and strategically placed are some fill in the blanks. And on the screen, there are some highlighted words that are underlined so they know what to fill in on this piece of paper. Okay. So that could be any Bible study up to this point. But the miracle is during the second half hour when you turn the paper over to the back. And on the back are a list of impression questions. Now what he does is he says, I'm not gonna ask 
fact questions that we could argue about. Because I may believe a different set of facts than you do. So I'm going to present the truth, and then I'm just going to ask impression questions, really heart questions that give the opportunity for the guests to get in touch with the Holy Spirit and just have a conversation with them and the Lord and let it come out. So it goes something like this. On the top of each piece of uh, paper, there are a list of possible responses. Mm -hmm. And then there are the impression questions. Now, he's not trying to shoehorn you into saying, you've got to answer one of these. There's uh, J, other. So you can go anywhere you want with this. But when you say heart questions, let's, kind of, let's go over this. It's like, I never thought of the possible responses. I never thought they're of that right before. Heart, heart questions means they're right-brained. They're emotional. Okay. So go ahead. So I never thought of that before is one response. Mm -hmm. That gives me hope. Yep. That's another. That's interesting. That's news to me. Impressive. Amazing. That challenges me. It makes sense. I see it, but I'll need time to get used to it or other. Right. So you're not asking them to just fill in the blank and say, okay, this is what the scripture says, but oh, I can think of another scripture that says something a little differently right. maybe. They're actually having to internalize it and it's a f more of a feeling, <clears throat> a right brain issue. you It's said. more, it, it's taking the heart and the mind and getting them to talk to each okay. other. Mm. And you'll notice on the same thing, you said it's not a fill in the blank. If you notice, there's no blanks. Yeah. Because we don't want you just to fill in your little pat answers. We want you to think about it from the heart level. So this one here is called One Seventh in Time. So if we've just watched this Bible study, and this is a Thunder in the Holy Land lesson here, uh, on the Sabbath, One Seventh in Time. Mm -hmm. And then we would go through this list of questions with the people. So question number one, Jesus claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. It, if this Sabbath doesn't exist, it's it makes you wonder how he could be the Lord of it. So you've heard people say, well, the Sabbath is done away with. Well, he claimed to be Lord of something. But if it's done away with, then he's Lord of, well, nothing. So what's your impression? Let's talk with, uh, with Melvin here first. He's a doctor, so he should have a good answer to this. What's your impression of number one? Jesus claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. If his Sabbath doesn't exist, it makes you wonder how he could be Lord of it. My answer to that, Charles, is H. It makes sense to me. Yeah. It makes sense to you? Yes. All right. Uh, Steve, what's your response? Well, I'll uh, assume and play the role of someone other than a conference president, and uh, I will suggest that I see it, but I'm going to need some time to get used to it. Now, so they're giving you a right brain response, uh, an emotional response. What I always do is follow up. So when Melvin says, uh, that makes sense to me. I say, Melvin, why does that make sense to you? Well, I see the logic of when, when Jesus was the one who claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath, he's the one who created it to begin with. Mm. And so I can connect the dots there. And so you don't have to be wizened in biblical knowledge. You just read the questions and let them answer. And you said, what was your response? I see it, but I'll need some time to get used to it. Uh -huh. Now, what happens if somebody says, I disagree with that, or I'll take some time to get used to it, then I'm, I'm right there with them. Say, I can understand how that could be. I can, that, that could take some getting used to. That's, that's a change for a lot of people. Shelly, what's your impression? Well, I'll go back to before the Lord taught me the truth. All right. And I would, I would have said, that challenges me. You know, because it would be like, I see this, but it challenges me because at the time, I'd been brought up believing that the Sunday replaced the Sabbath. So we've watched this movie, and then now you're saying, or the program, and we're saying that. It would have challenged me greatly. Yeah. And so I. But I like, you know what I like about what you're showing me here is that even though it challenges me, I don't feel like you're challenging me because it's not like you're pointing your finger at That's me right. and saying, this is the right answer. It's That's just, right. hmm. I've got to think about this. Right. Yeah. Let's look at number two. Jesus taught that God's gift of the Sabbath was not given to any special people group, but to all mankind. After all, only Adam and Eve were in the garden representing all mankind. Steve, what's your impression? I never thought of that before. Which is choice A? <laughs> Which is choice A? I never thought of that before. Shelley, what's your impression? Well, I would have said probably that's news to me. 
Okay. You know, because it, we're, of course, we're role playing and going course. back some years here. But I think that there's a lot of people who never really thought about God instituting the Sabbath in the garden and that it was for all mankind because uh, at least in the church of my youth, I was grown, I grew up believing that the Sabbath was only for the Jews. So mm -hmm. that would have been my response then. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Brother Melvin, what's your response? I'll put down B, that gives me hope. You know, I, like what Shelley has mentioned, there's a lot of focus that this was only given for, for, the, for the Jews. And, but really, I'd like to be able to enjoy and celebrate this Sabbath as the Bible has stated. Yeah. Now, I'm, every time somebody gives that kind of an answer, I'm definitely going to follow up with that. And so I would ask him, why does that give you hope? And, and, and allow them to talk. Now, you think, well, half the group is, is, is maybe a born-again, believing, sincere believer. The other half may be pagan. They may be from another church persuasion, another mm -hmm. faith group, a faith mm -hmm. family. And so you would think that the people in your church are all on the same page. You'd think but they're not. They're not. <laughs> there are some people who wake up in the morning and they wonder if God even cares. Yeah. They've just lost a spouse. Uh, their child has just come down with some dread disease. And when they come to a Bible study and they say, you know, that gives me hope. Now, I can say to somebody who's hurting, you know, you should just trust in the Lord. And I'd be right. And I'd be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But if they say, you know, that gives me hope. Then tomorrow morning when the devil's sitting on their chest and they can't get out of bed, mm -hmm. they remember, I, I, I have a hope. Mm -hmm. Because we only remember 30% of what we say. Uh, of what others say. Of others say. And 70% of what we say. So when we say, that gives me hope, that gives me courage, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a change, that's your, that's your statement. Amen. And that makes a difference. Let's do one more. Okay. Not only did perfect people in a perfect world enjoy the Sabbath, but Moses directed the Israelites to begin keeping the Sabbath again before they left Egypt. Now, I've read this in a book, but I've never ever preached this because it's not in the Bible, you see. And so you can't say something that's not in the Bible if you're having a Bible study. Until one day I was reading my Bible and I had my Strong's Concordance there with me. And I discovered that what was written in that book is written in the Bible. Because Pharaoh accused Moses, and this is brought out in the video, which right. the people haven't had a chance to see. Mo uh, Pharaoh said, you cause the people to rest. That's what it says in my King yes. James Bible. Yes. But that word isn't rest. What is it? It's Sabbath. It's Sabbath. It's sh Shabbat. You cause Shabbat. the people to Shabbat. And so it's in the Bible, it's just that I wasn't reading it in the original language. And so that's why this question is here. So Jesus taught that the gift of the Sabbath was not given to any special people group, but to all men, I'm wrong one. Not only did perfect people in a perfect world enjoy the Sabbath, but Moses directed the Israelites to begin keeping the Sabbath again before they left Egypt. Shelley, what's your impression? Oh, amazing. Amazing. I think most people would have found that amazing. Yeah. Because I, like you, I went through that same Shabbat study and it was, that was amazing to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Melvin, what's your impression? I put down that's interesting. And why, because, is, why is that interesting to you? Because I never thought about that angle, you know, where what you just, what is shared here in this question that, that Moses did direct the Israelites before they left, they left uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very interesting to me to have find this information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve? Well, I'll stay in the role of a cynic and say that's news to me. That's yeah. news to me. <laughs> so you've never heard that before. You know what's fascinating to me is when you allow this to take place, when you allow people to then get in touch with their right brain and their left brain and get them both, get the corvus callosum talking, I think that's the right word, with the highway between the two hemispheres, and, and, and get them to start thinking logically and emotionally about what they're reading, uh, people will say things like, wow, I need to quit smoking. And I'm thinking, this study isn't about cigarettes. You know, we're not even, were we talking about cigarettes? And that this, this will come out of their mouth. You know, wow, I need to quit beating my wife. You say, well, we weren't having a Bible study on how to treat your spouse here. The things that come out of their mouth 
when they read these things where the Lord brings a conviction to yeah. their heart. And now, instead of me saying, you know, you should be different, you should eat different, dress different, live different, act different, you're saying it, and now I say, how can I help? You know what I really, really like about, and, and Chuck Coley, I believe, was led by the Holy it Spirit of God because Absolutely. this engages people. There's no right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. This is about how I feel. So you can't tell me that my feelings are wrong. They're mine. That's right. So it's not, you know, a lot of times when you get people in a Bible study and you do start asking questions, it's kind of like they're sitting back and they're afraid to answer. But now, or, or they feel like you want to give them a pat answer, this is a conversation, it will launch a deeper conversation. That's right. And, and also expose the need that they have. Shelly, one of the things that I, I teach when, in my discipleship training when I work with couples is the five levels of communications. The first level is information and facts, the second is opinions, and the third level is emotions. I said, you can't get to that deep level of of communication of when you do not uh, acknowledge the emotion of that individual. Yeah. Here, it allows you to, to affirm someone's uh, uh, emotional response, yes. response from the truth that they're studying or they watch. So it's not necessarily an, just an opinion or, uh, or a factual response, but basically it's an emotional, heartfelt response. And this is what's unique about this, because once you fulfill that and you, you affirm that individuals mm -hmm. acknowledge in their emotional response, they're ready for the next few levels of, of uh, communications. And so they're allowing, in a sense, the Holy Spirit, instead of just a cognitive information, now it's also a heartfelt response. Amen. So when they get in touch with what the Holy Spirit and them are talking about, and it comes out of their mouth, we've been told, be careful what you say, because it comes out of your mouth, it goes in your ear, and then you believe it's fact. So if I say, Shelly doesn't like me, well, then I'm just going to look for things to prove that Shelly didn't like me. But when I say something positive, Shelly really likes me, then I'm going to look for that. So we're giving them an opportunity to hear the Holy Spirit saying something positive out of their mouth, where the Holy Spirit's leading them. And, mm -hmm. and that's the primary purpose of this kind of a conversation, so where their heart, their, their emotional level gets in touch with with uh, where the Lord is, is seeking to lead them. Amen. And if they're not traveling as fast as we want, we know where they're at. So we just slow down a little bit and travel with them. If they're, if they're picking up the pace, just like uh, Melvin just said, we can affirm them in that. Uh, who, do, who, do, who do others say I am? <laughs> who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. I don't think it was just a fact. Well, you're the Christ, the uh, Son of God. No, no, no. Revelation. There was a revelation. Amen. You are the Christ, the Son of God. Amen. And Jesus immediately said, flesh and blood did not reveal that. To Amen. Him. Amen. And now I get to do that for people because when they have these insights, I can say that, and I've actually said that in these studies. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. That's something God is showing to you. So you are the, sitting with Pastor Chuck uh, Coley. He is showing you this. And this is where the passion began, because uh -huh. we're actually going through one of your studies now, but you, you brought him here to 3ABN, and he's such a precious man. Pastor Chuck, if you are watching tonight, God bless you, and we're just really grateful for your following of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. But then now, you actually took this, and being brought up in the video age, as you said, you wanted to do something more. So we've been running this series that you went and taped in Israel. Mm -hmm. This was a beautiful series, all taped on location. How long did it actually take for the taping? Well, we were in Israel for four and a half months, okay. which doesn't sound too bad. But we've been working at this project for, <laughs> for two and a half years uh, because uh, it, it, it take us to do it. You know, when I first saw what Pastor Chuck did, I said, it worked for Chuck. Will it work for me? You know, is it replicatable? Yeah. So your viewing audience is already familiar with In Search of the Truth. Yes. And that, that has aired so much on 3B, and people have just loved it. I, I, I was here visiting your call center one time, and there's a lady, and I'm sorry I don't remember her name, but she's probably watching, and, and she knows her name. She comes every year and gives you a month of her life. 
every year. Just she'll sweep the floor, she'll pack boxes, she'll just do whatever. She's just a volunteer, and and praise God for people like that. Amen. And I sh I would probably try to guess her name, but we have a number of beautiful <laughs> volunteers who do things like that. She saw me over there, and she said, you know, she recognized me from from in search of the truth. So, so she said to me, none of my family knows the Lord. And I have been waiting for the right thing to share with some of my family who doesn't know the Lord. And she says, and I chose in search of the truth. Because I wrote this for the people out there. And so I went home and wrote my own heart questions for this, which I never intended. This, this, this was, I was thinking a Bible study. And so I didn't make it from the ground up as a Bible study. But I started giving Bible studies using In Search of Truth and my own heart questions, and immediately I started getting the same results Chuck did. So then I knew Chuck was on to something. So I went to the conference and I said to them, I want to remake Chuck's videos. And we all agreed, and then there was a downturn in the economy, and the administration changed, and it didn't happen. So I began to pray, and I said, Lord, I have a passion for this, but this is going to take hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it right. I mean, you can just throw anything together. This one was done in a pole barn. <laughs> but I said, I want this one to be done in a way that anyone could use it. And uh, the Lord then provided those funds. And, well, enough of them okay. to get me to step out of the safety net of where I was, get my wife to, to quit. And we went over to Israel and began videoing with these three precious young people. And, uh, and I wanted the scripts all written before I left. It didn't. <laughs> of course, it never happens the way you want it to. It didn't happen. <laughs> At that time, I, just as we were setting up the 501c3 for Questline Productions, Karen's father, my wife's father, mm. was tragically run over. Oh, mercy. I didn't his, know that. His ribs were flayed. His spine was sheared. And uh, he had been talking about going with us. Oh. And when we went to the hospital, he turned to his wife and he said, well, I guess that takes care of that. Is he, I've not heard this story before. I'm surprised. And yeah. he said, I want you to go anyway. Yeah. So we went over to Israel, and Karen sat on the balcony there overlooking Bethlehem and had her last conversation with her father. Oh. Mm. Anyway, it chokes me up a little bit. Yeah. Um, God provided uh, some funding <clears throat> through two different sources, and we were both able to fly back for his funeral. And then we went mm. back and finished. Mm. So uh, that was a hard time for us. And we just knew the devil was trying to do everything he could mm -hmm. to stop this from happening. But these young people are so impressive. They love the Lord. They do love Oh, them. it's obvious. And I was working so hard at writing these scripts, I just couldn't get it all done. They wrote some of the scripts. Mm. Some of the scripts from Thunder in the Holy Land were written by these young people. Mm -hmm. And their stories are written into them. And so you'll, if you're watching three, uh, Thunder on 3ABN, you will hear them talking personally yes. because it's their story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we worked and we worked and uh, you've been airing them and I was trying to get them all done ahead of time. Uh, but and, we're... And now we've been airing this for close to a year, I believe now, but you have something, a big announcement that you wanted big to make tonight. <laughs> All right. And your big announcement is that finally we've got something <laughs> really that can be shared. See that? Yes. I brought that along. My secretary sent it. Well, I, I'm glad. I, I thought you were bringing out a USB Should we be for a minute. <laughs> Should you be worried? <laughs> yeah. so, this last week, a delivery truck showed up in front of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference Office <laughs> and and delivered us a finished copy of Thunder in the Holy. So we finally have the entire video series done now. The entire series. There it is. Exciting. Exciting. I'm excited. Amen. Because now for the first time in denominational history not only can people buy an effective Bible study that is easy to use, heart questions, 
But now something else is unique because this was built from the ground up so that the local pastor could replace me as the host. Yeah, we, you brought a couple of clips that you wanted to show. Let's, uh, how, what, which, what well, would let, you like let, to show first? Let's, let's show the one with the, uh, with the pastors replacing me, the young people right. talking about it. Okay. Being in the Middle East and preparing this new teaching tool will forever be a highlight in my life. I agree, Levi. It was a lot of work. What a joy to be where Jesus was, digging into the teachings that have made the world a better place to live. But what did you mean when you said teaching tool? Well, Andrea, Thunder in the Holy Land was designed from the ground up to be a Bible study where the local pastor gets inserted into the video as a host, replacing Charles. What a great idea. Now the local pastor and the church members can be a team working together. And our viewers can get all the details at our website, qlp.tv. So if you've been watching Thunder in the Holy Land, which is, it's done in the National Geographic style. It's really a beautiful thing to share. And it's exploring all the teachings of Jesus. And if you've watched, everywhere that you see Charles is kind of does the rap, an intro and, a, and the out, if you will, the local pastor can actually come to Questline Productions. He can be videoed and replace you. So everything else, the beautiful on-site uh, filming and the young people, everything else remains the same. He just comes and takes over your role, essentially. And I want to talk with you, uh, Steve, with, as the president for the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, this concept of having a complete Bible study series that individual members could go out and use as a great tool for evangelism and discipleship and not feel uh, intimidated to, to share a Bible study. This really caught your attention, particularly the idea that the pastors could be inserted. Tell us a little bit about the Kentucky, Tennessee involvement in sure. this. Well, it's a story of how the Lord is never taken by surprise and He's always in front of us and ahead of us. When I became president of Kentucky, Tennessee Conference, within a short amount of time, we begin engaging administratively with my leadership, ministerial director, our, mm -hmm. our treasurer, our conference secretary, uh, reviewing and assessing our evangelism strategy. Uh, like the church itself, like its members, like conferences across North America and even around the world, we are in the business of uh, extending the kingdom of God, seeking and saving the lost, and uh, taking quite seriously the, the, the commission that's entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And like other places, we had to do some deep, authentic soul searching and reviewing uh, how we were spending money, our strategy, and uh, telling ourselves we're pleased with what the Lord has given us and what we're doing, but we're not entirely pleased. And uh, the fact is that we were spending a, a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of God's money, but we're not achieving the kind of results that we believe God would have us achieve and, and uh, experience. Right. And so around that time in discussion of new strategies and new options, I don't remember Charles exactly how uh, it first came to my uh, knowledge or I awareness. Think David Hartman. <laughs> okay. Our ministerial director uh, had some discussion with me one day in my office and said, uh, uh, Elder Haley, do you know uh, a Charles Bird? He's, he's got uh, some things that he's doing. Uh, he's a pastor up in Wisconsin and he's got an idea of how to be more effective in evangelism. And interestingly, I said, you know, is that the same Charles Bird that maybe I went to high school with many, many years ago? <laughs> it turned out it was. And uh, our ways had separated over the decades, but um, to, to shorten that part of the story, we became a little bit more familiar with uh, perhaps uh, s the early stages of this. And uh, of course, you had been working in the area for a while, but you had this new idea, this thunder in the Holy Land. And uh, the genius of it, as you've already so well expressed, is to uh, invest in small group studies. Of course, it can be big or small, it can be one-on-one, -on -one, but ideally, at least our thought was, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a new engaging study that involves uh, groups of people 
hosted by a church member, a pastor, certainly can be a church member, that uh, not only uh, brings into the, to the, to the discussion these very important, engaging heart questions that we've just reviewed earlier, but might actually insert the local pastor in the DVD itself. Mm -hmm. And it really brings back uh, a couple of, of important, important uh, facets to, we think, being effective in uh, evangelism, and that is having conversational uh, a dialogue with people that you come to know and you form friendships and you build bonds and relationships and out of that is perhaps as it always has been the most effective grounds by which people make a decision for Jesus with the added dimension of having the local pastor um, actually be the host uh, we've had some fun and said that that, that person's the Katie Couric of, of the series <laughs> but uh, would actually be the person that's actually uh, um, being uh, in the video itself and in the series. And the, the wonderful thing would be when uh, perhaps not the pastor, maybe a church member is leading the study and the people who are participating say, you know, it's been great, we've really loved this series. We'd love to meet this person, this host. Oh, really? Well, that's my pastor. Really? Yeah, and the church is just down the street. So uh, we're, we're on the early side of this. It's, it's rolling out. But in Kentucky, Tennessee Conference, we have been willing and even excited to invest in a new strategy, unproven but promising, to see what the Lord can do with this. We believe he's gonna do some great things with this new tool, and we're excited to be partners with you uh, in, in, this, uh, in this project. Now, I know at least 40 of your pastors have already been inserted in from your conference. 30. And 30, excuse 30. me. Well, <laughs> you know, that's an evangelist in me. Is <laughs> we're gonna bring a little bit here. <laughs> but, um, Dr. Santos, Melvin, uh, you are one of those yes. who has been inserted as the Katie Couric of the series. <laughs> um, tell us why this appealed to you personally. I mean, you are the liaison and, and the trainer for discipleship. Why did it appeal to you personally to, to uh, become a part of this project and participate in it? Shall we? Why this appealed to me is because um, being a discipleship trainer, I, in, in a church setting, I'm always looking for the very best tools to equip members. Discipleship is equipping members to become lay ministers and lay leaders. Amen. And, and it's not, and here, usually in, in a church setting, uh, evangelism, discipleship, the people are looking for the pastor to take the lead. Mm -hmm. But once you have a, a, a discipleship platform, you now have given the biblical uh, emphasis in Ephesians 4 that ministers are equipping right. the laity, the body of Christ, mm -hmm. to, to minister and to nurture the body of Christ. And so what's happening here now, this is just a perfect fit to a discipleship platform. So here, not only in my church setting in Nashville, I, I'm excited to be able to now put a new tool that leaders, leaders in this training would be able to, to apply in their small group settings, in their family settings, and even in a larger setting or in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Not, all, not only that, also for, because what, representing the North American Division in Discipleship Resources, here's another opportunity as I train pastors in being able to tell them this is something that, that I've tried myself in my church and also have seen the results of this and being able to evaluate them. That's the goal here is to be able to equip them with the very best tools. It's a perfect fit because it's not just tra training them for evangelism, it's basically training them in various forms of ministries and soul winning. Amen. And let me tell you why this is so critically important. Right now, the North American Division is spending $44,000 per baptism. That number is staggering. And unsustainable. And unsustainable. <laughs> And the method of Jesus has already proven to work. In, in Jesus' day, they didn't have a, the church did not have a lot of money. Mm -hmm but they could tell another soul about Jesus. Right. In, 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 in the 1800s, at the beginning of the Adventist church, our church was poor. They didn't have a lot of money. These were a scattered flock of people who believed Jesus was coming soon and wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a lot of money, but they could tell a person. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the work is going to be done not because of the evangelists or the pastors. It's going to be because people tell people about their that's best right. friend, Amen. Jesus. Amen. And that's why we called it Thunder in the Holy Land because it's called that because it's the teachings of Jesus. It's something that Jesus taught. And every time he opened his mouth, it caused a storm of controversy. <laughs> so we called it that. And so this is an opportunity for church members to say, uh, I've just got a new, a new video, a new video. You don't say a 26 episode video. <laughs> you say a new video. Uh, about uh, Jesus, and, and it's called Thunder in the Holy Land. Would you like to watch it with me? Oh, sure. We'll come over Tuesday night. We'll have some soup, and we'll watch it together. So they watch this video, some friends of theirs, some family members, whatever. They watch this video, go through the heart questions, and when they get to the end, it says, would you, would you like to, to come to the next one? Yeah, I think I would. Uh, this, was, it, this was fun. And so they do one and two and three, and pretty soon they're into it, and, and, and they're, the church members find that they can be effective soul winners for Jesus. I'd like to give another statistic that is very troubling. We all know what's happening in Detroit. Detroit is, is a bus town. I mean, they, they're just bulldozing entire city blocks. That is going to happen to the entire nation, and Congress knows it. That's why they're running scared. Why? Because every day in America, 10,000 baby boomers are retiring. And that is going to affect this church as well as all the other churches because the baby boomer generation is the supporting generation. Hmm. That's where the thought. lion share of it comes from. So we've got a 10-year window. That's it. And all the baby boomers are going to be retired. So we've got 10 years to change this, to turn this around, to, to re-align uh, ourselves with the laity doing it. Instead of $44,000 for soul saved, we can bring this down into the double digits. Oh, that's double digits. In fact, I brought some slides just to show you. Pastor Santos is one of our pastors, and we showed him in the slide. But if, if a pastor does this, and he says, I'm going to get six Bible studies started, and he has three guests and some church members as well, then he has 18 guests. And if, if only 50% of them make a decision for Jesus in one year, he's brought nine people into the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In the second year, he says, well, I can do better than that. Uh, I'll get 10 Bible studies and I'll use my new members who are in love with Jesus and I'll give them a set of my DVDs and I'll have them immediately go out and start sharing Jesus with their family and their friends. Mm -hmm. And they have three guests on average. That's 30 people coming. And, and if only 50% make a decision for Jesus, that's another 15. Now, you're, in two years, you're up to 24 members. In some of these small churches, 24 members would double the size of the church. That's true. And then on the third year, they say, well, we're really going to go gangbusters. We're going to go with 20 Bible studies because now we've got 16 new people. They're helping, plus the church members are helping, the pastors. Are 20 is easy, three guests on average. That's giving studies to 60 people in the year. 50% make a decision for Christ. Now we're up to 54 new members new souls who are passionately in love with Jesus. You, you repeat that again the fourth year, and, and you've got another 30 members. Now we're up to 84. So in just four years, you have 90, uh, uh, 84 new members, and it only costs $95 per member. Well, it's obvious. Instead of 44000 Yeah, this is obvious. It's a very effective tool. And it's not just something, I, I, before we move on from this, I want to say it's not just something that the pastors can do. You actually have had someone who is a layman who has stepped up to the plate and said, I'm very active in event. I mean, he, he works full time, but he's active in evangelism. Steve, tell us about this gentleman, because it's just a fascinating idea that someone has said, hey, this is so exciting and it's, it's so effective. Mm -hmm. Tell us about him. Sure. Well, because the project is kind of in its infancy stage, our first focus is to equip pastors with this, uh, with this tool. But uh, in our minds, in our thought, in our strategy, and hopefully Charles joins me in this, I Absolutely. think it's part of his thinking, is that down the road we would like to produce this series using uh, lay people. Um, church members who would like to be the featured presenter in the series, like the pastor is presently. And so we had an experience where one of our pastors who was scheduled to do the filming um, had to back out for personal reasons. 
And uh, this pastor uh, actually pastors in the uh, southeastern part of the state of Kentucky, um, part of our Appalachian stretch of the conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that's a rather poor, uh, depressed area economically, but with some great people, uh, both church members as well as the citizens who live there. They're hungry for the gospel and trying to reach them of itself is, is challenging. But when this pastor uh, was not able to participate in the filming, one of our leaders, uh, church leaders in that part of, of our conference. And when you say church leader, you're talking about a regular member who is steps up to the plate to, right. to lead out and things. Absolutely, and, and I don't not... mind identifying him by name, Daniel McFeeters, mm -hmm. who by profession works in the computer field, mm -hmm. but is a very active uh, um, part of that small congregation in southeastern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And both he and his wife do health seminars. They've built relationships in the community with the uh, Department of Health and, and others throughout uh, a, a number of counties in southeastern Kentucky, why he asked, uh, is it possible that I could take the place of the pastor? Uh, I'm, I'm presenting already in various seminars and, and, and venues throughout southeastern Kentucky. Is it possible that, that the Kentucky Tennessee Conference would be willing to sponsor me in the video? And we said, yes, we'd like to do that. And uh, we foresee a, a time, it may be a little further down the road, when, when we would actually invite and encourage and support uh, more church members, just uh, anyone who has a passion and a desire to be a part of this uh, incredible new venture, and perhaps they could be in the series themselves. And you know, the interesting thing to me is that's a, that's a strong commitment level because you don't have to, I mean, you can take this as it's produced. Yep. You can take it and, and use this one-on-one. -on -one. I, I could start this with my neighbor tomorrow, right. you know, and, and use the heart questions, and I think this would be very effective. I don't have to uh, be inserted into this. That's right. But I think that what, what he sees as a layman and sees this, and certainly what you see as pastors, is that there is something about, um, if I were a pastor in a church, I'd want to re replace you per personally to increase that one-on-one um, um, -on -one feeling of mm -hmm. being reached out by the pastor, uh, or that the pastor is the one who is teaching you, so sure. you're developing that relationship, and this is what this man is doing. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be with the insertion, but it's obvious that it can be. I, I might just add a, a thought if that's, that's okay, um, and that's in regards to something Charles said earlier about the changing culture and, and the movement of generations and where we're at in time. And on the uh, trip in tonight, we were just talking about how uh, people younger than perhaps the three of us um, think and react to information differently. You could say four of us. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in a generation past, my own generation even, uh, we, we reacted and made decisions based on propositional truth. In other words, you prove something from scripture sure. and you share a series of texts and we say, does that make sense? We, uh, yes, it does. Okay, what are you going to do with it? And there's still a, a part of that. There's an element in this study that mm. includes that. But we think importantly, certainly for this generation uh, and many, that's uh, a large slice of our culture called postmodern, uh, who, who learn and uh, make decisions mm -hmm. maybe differently than we do. That relationship right. part is very critical. And so we are returning, we think, to a biblical model, the model of the New Testament era church mm -hmm. of having these close personal conversations, building relationships, where we believe that's how people that uh, we're describing, the postmoderns, younger people uh, than, than, than the three of us, I'll stay with that. That's how they make decisions. And so that takes us back to that bridge building relationship component that's so important. Amen, amen. So I have a passion and I have a dream and I have a vision. And that vision is, is that that 1,000 tonight 1,000 3ABN listeners, viewers, would say, I could do that. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to do that. So, they're available now. <laughs> Amen. They're available now. Uh, we don't have to wait any longer. I don't have to. People would, would say, when is it going to be done? Well, it's going to be done in March. And then a year later, it's going to be done in, 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 in March. And then, and then a year and a half later. So it was just this constant struggle. Finally, people would say, when is it going to be done? I said, no man knoweth the day or the hour. <laughs> but now it's done. And so I would love to see a thousand people out there not look at this as a set of DVDs that they're purchasing. Don't do that. Ask yourself this question. Would I give $325 if I knew that it was going to save someone for the kingdom? Would I do that? 
And some people will say, sure, I, I, if I knew that $325 would save somebody, I would. What if you knew that $325 would save two people? What if, if that $325 would save five people or ten people? And so this series, which is retailing for $325, we're making it available on a special for the 3BN viewing family. And we're going to show you that slide right now. And this is the breakdown because we're even going to give it in bulk sales if people want. If one person says, I want to buy this, just $250. Not 325, just 250. If they want two or uh, up, up to five, just 200. Six to nine, 175. Ten or more, 150. And if you're an ASI member, when you call in, ask for the special code because ASI is subsidizing this for the first 250 ASI Wonder. members. They can get it tonight for just hundred dollars. Wonderful. And that's all on our website. And you can go to our website, uh, QLP.tv, or you can call the two numbers that are on the screen. And we've got uh, two lovely ladies, my wife and Janelle, standing by. Mm -hmm. They'll take your calls. But we'd love to see a thousand people immediately start proving that anybody can, su can successfully give a Bible study. And you know, the thought occurred to me that this would be something wonderful that you might want to buy this for your church library. Sure. If you buy 10 or 20 copies, you can actually, we'll get back to you, Melvin, in the second hour, but you can actually get other members involved in discipleship. This is something that is, uh, anybody can do this. Before we go to, we're, we're, our first hour is running very quickly, our time's running out, and we want to talk about our offer, but just very briefly, we were talking about the pastors being inserted. How do they do that? It, we send them we, the scripts. It's about 260 minutes is all. Okay. So it's, uh, they, they speak about nine minutes per episode, and there's 26 episodes. So they go over their scripts, become familiar, then they come to the studio uh, with, their, with their outfits. We get them ready. We video capture them. I used to say we shoot them. <laughs> Until one day a church member said, you're shooting the pastors, can I help? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we video capture the pastors and, uh, and then we put it together in a, in a finished package where they have nice DVDs and they have the master set for themselves and for life they, they can, can make copy. as many copies as they want and give them to their church members. How exciting. Well, we do encourage you to make that phone call and we'll put that information up again in just a moment. But at the same time, we want to, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the biblical foundation of discipleship and why this is the way God wants us to operate. But we also want to remind you that this is a live program and you can call us with your questions at 618-627-4651. Or if you have comments, you can send them to live at 3abn.org. Org. O-R-G. Also, if you want the free offer, this is the first time uh, that Steve Haley, and uh, who is the president of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, you were here, and Charles, you were here with us, and we did the Thunder Project. We had some really good information on this interview, as I recall. We were talking about the being fishers of men and how all of this works. That would be our free offer. If you would like this DVD, you'll find some very fascinating information on this. We are coming right down to the tail end of this first hour. Um, in the second hour, we are going to be talking about more of the biblical principle of discipleship and why thunder, we, we've told a little bit about this and most of you know the Thunder in the Holy Land Project so well because it's such a popular series. But tell us, just give us a little tease for what we're going to be talking about in the second hour. Well, as you know, this is an entire series on the doctrines of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the truths of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I'm pouring over the truths of Jesus. I, I, I just went over them like 30 times, just the four Gospels to, to ramp up for this. And I realized that there were some doctrines and teachings of Jesus that I, as a Christian, as a pastor, as someone who had grown up in a church family, never knew before, mm. that had been ignored. Mm. And when we come back, I think some people are going to be surprised mm. at some of the things that they are hearing. And the only other person I've heard say what I'm going to say in the next half hour is our former General Conference President, uh, 
Falkenberg, Elder Falkenberg. Well, that is very exciting to hear then. So we invite you to get a glass of water and take a quick break and come back and join us. We'll be back with you in just a moment. <music> 